Bob is our senior pastor and he has an awesome word for you today. Thanks, Karina. How are we, church? We're good? Who is excited about Christmas? Who is terrified about Christmas? Yeah, I'm slightly sitting there. I'm terrified about Christmas thing. Not because I don't like Christmas. It's just that time of year. Everything's happening. It's busy. Narelle, um, she's our... She basically runs a church. Uh, she, she, like on, on Wednesday, she came to me and, and she said, so can I start putting up Christmas decorations? I'm like, it's November. And she said, yes, but I've had them stored in my office for the last couple of weeks, waiting for the right moment to bring them out. Uh, and so if you were to go upstairs to, into the offices, you're met with tinsel and Christmas decorations. And as soon as you go in, I think the next thing is she's going to get those pine tree fragrant things. So you think you're walking into a pine forest. Is that right, really? Yes, mate, yes. See, I'm preempting what she's thinking. Uh, I... I love it. I enjoy it. I've got nothing against it. So I'm looking forward to Christmas. Our um, Christmas um, service on the 22nd is going to be fantastic. There's uh, like we're going to have Christmas carols. Everyone likes Christmas carols. I'm pretty sure everyone likes Christmas carols. If you don't, then you're just not going to enjoy it. Um, so there's going to be Christmas carols, and then we're going to have a photo booth. Why are we having a photo booth? Why? Because everyone wants to have Christmas happy snaps with their family, and so you can send that to your friends, and you can put it on your fridge or do whatever you want to do with it and just say, it's Christmas. We like Christmas. So that's coming up. Um, so here's my encouragement. Put in your diary. It's the 22nd of December. It's a Sunday. You're probably going to be here anyways, but realize this. It is our Christmas service. Sound good? Yeah, yeah fantastic. So um, we are in... Part four of a four-part sermon series that we've been going through. So we're going to be ending it um, today. Some of you are like, oh gosh, that's fantastic. I've been waiting for this to be over. Um, so but we're ending it today, if that's, if that's you. Um, if you've missed out on any of it, my encouragement would be jump on YouTube and follow along there. But So the, the sermon series has been um, a series that we've titled Moral Fabric with, with the idea that the, the morals that we build our lives around today determine the reality that we experience tomorrow. And, and so the, the, the premise looks like as far as morals, they're the things that we say yes to or we say no to. As far as that's what would teach if you got if you're a parent, you've got young kids, or or even just you would build your life around as far as that's a good thing to have in my life, that's a good thing for my children to have, for my friends to have. I'm gonna say yes to that. I'm gonna encourage people to say yes because we can f- build a foundation off that. Or no, that is really bad, I'm not gonna go there um, like like at all. And so th- those things that we call morals or ethics or whatever you wanna term them, that they will determine those things that we build our life on will determine the, the future that we experience tomorrow. So We've been traveling through that for the last um, three weeks. And so last week we had Pastor Mick Geeling over from um, New Life Chapel in Wodonga sharing part three, which was fantastic. If you missed it, jump on um, YouTube and follow along. If you're not sure where on YouTube to find it, type in Epicenter Church and you will generally get really bad pictures of my face um, come up as the things to click on. It's safe if you click on them. It is safe. It is my face, and they're normally bad screenshots, but click on them, it'll be, you, you'll be safe, and that'll be something good. Um, so my encouragement is jump on and, and check that out, but so I'm going to do my best to end it uh, this week, but before I do that, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get into it. So God, I thank you for the opportunity that we've had to uh, travel through this series, Jesus, and, 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 and to talk about it, Father, and to talk about what you're wanting to us to build our lives on Father and to found our lives on Jesus. And I pray that as I close up this morning, I pray that what we do is we hear your voice, we hear what you're whispering, what you're declaring, what you're speaking to us, and that we're able to take that and we're able to action that and we're able to build our lives on that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So I've been, for, for those of you that don't know me, I've been a Christian predominantly all my life. I grew up in a Christian family. I went to church consistently. Um, my entire family are Christians or at, at least attend church consistently. And so that looks like on my mother's side, Christians, um, and even beyond that, my gr- grandfather and his family, my great-grandfather, and on both sides of the family, that's, that's what it looks like. But um, in different sides of the family, there's been some really strange theology that I picked up on, or at least I thought that's what they're telling me. And if you're not sure what theology is it's like the study of God, the study of Scripture, and um, things like that. And so I had, and I was sharing it with our small group recently, the, a few weeks ago, which they thought was quite amusing. And in retrospect, looking back, it was quite amusing. Um, I had this this theory that God was constantly looking for a reason to discredit me, and not to accept me, and not to love me, and not to want anything to do with me. And, and this, I believe, came from 
my grandmother because that's who my memory was that she used to talk to me about it. And, and because this is what she used to say, when you get to heaven, you, like, everyone's going to line up and there's going to be this massive big screen that, that you're going to see all your actions. It's only going to be your bad actions as far as things that we would call sin. And it's going to be played in playback mode on this screen for you to watch. But not just for you. Everyone in heaven is, is going to watch it. And so and this, is, this is how my mind would think. Like Everyone is lined up like as far as they're, they're waiting for tacos in a line or something like that. Why tacos? I don't know. But they're lined up, and then, then everyone shuffles along, and so you're like, oh, gosh, look at what that person did. They're, they're criminals. They're, they're this. And then God makes his judgment. So this is a judgment, judgment time. If, you, if I'm losing you, I'm really sorry. I'm going somewhere with this. It's going to be okay. And, and then it, you keep shuffling along and watch everyone's replays of, of their life, of their, everything that had gone wrong. And then it gets to you, and everything is, is up there on a projector screen specifically all the stuff that you didn't repent of. And then, then God looks at it and He determines what's going to happen to you, whether you're going to go to hell or whether you're going to go to heaven based on that. So I lived in this state of perpetual fear that there was something in my life I hadn't confessed to God. So, I was, so I'd get in bed and I was, I was young and I'd be in bed every night and praying and praying like, as far as God, you need to show me whatever sins that I've done that I don't know that I've done so I can confess it so nothing really bad happens to me when, when I die. And I'd have this, this like check, list sort of thing as far as I'd lie in bed at night and confess everything. And then after a while, it'd be like stuff I would remember from like a week ago that I'd forgotten about at that time and that something would come up like, I forgot to do that. Imagine if I'd have died between now and then, like this would have been absolutely tragic. And, and so this was a large portion of, of my life. And I'm not advocating that this is good or proper theology or how this is at all what, how the Bible or Jesus works. And if we were to fast forward, and so like slowly but surely, things started changing my theology, but not completely. And I had this, because this was still going on as, as far as I'm not sure if God's going to accept me. I'm not sure if God's going to um, choose me or anything. And then if you, if you get to the end of the Bible, there's this theology called the rapture. All right, this this idea that at the, at the, in the last days that all the Christians get sucked up to heaven. And everyone else gets, gets left just existing on the earth for this, this period of time and, and all that sort of thing. And I remember <laughs> some of the link is starting to laugh already. There was, this, there was this one time I was driving my car. So yeah, I just got my license. So this is how long this stuff stayed with me. I was driving along in my car and it was, it was around Christmas time. And there's this thing came on the radio and I was sure it was the call for the rapture. I don't know how this stuff even pops in your head. But I was sure it was, and I was waiting to get sucked out of the vehicle, and nothing. And I was like, oh, nothing, nothing's happened. I, I, like, God must and I'm not making this up. My mind must have been quite sporadic, because I was positive that God had neglected me. God had pushed me aside. God had left me behind. And, and um, anyway, so I, I, I was driving along. I thought, maybe it's not. Maybe I'm just making this up and nothing's happened and I'm incorrect. So I know what to do. I'll ring someone. I'll, ring, I'll start ringing people because I was that generation that's always had phones. And um, so I thought I'll, I'll ring my pastor because I'm pretty sure he's going to go to heaven. And I ring him and I can't get hold of him. And then I ring him again. I still can't get hold of him. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure my family are Christians. And so if the rapture has happened and ever all these Christians are being taken up to heaven, if I'm losing you, I'm sorry. We can talk about this later. Um, I thought I'll ring my family. I'll start going through my family. I'm pretty sure that they're going to go to heaven as well. And I ring, I can't get hold of anyone. And so then I start going through my friends and I'm, I'm pretty sure that they're Christians and I can't get hold of anyone. And so then I'm, I spend the next, so this is like mid-morning, I spend the rest of the day not connecting with anyone that, that I determined or I believe were Christians. I'm like, I'm surrounded by non-Christians. Obviously, there was something that I didn't confess. There was something that I've done that I haven't talked to God about. He's rejected me. I've been left behind. Everything is falling apart. And I remember driving home that evening after finishing work, thinking, I'm going home to an empty house to where, like, as, as far as, like, I'm going to be the only one. I'm going to spend the next period of time by myself without a family. And I get home, and my family's there. I'm like, ah, oh, no, it didn't happen. It's, it's fantastic. Then I had this thought, Maybe they're bad as well, and they didn't get taken. And so I had to wait to church on Sunday to like feel to feel sure that everything was good. And um, so that's a little bit of me, <laughs> a little bit messed up. And I, I do not at all um, believe that or agree with that or or, or anything of of the sort like that. Um, 
like a, 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 any more with regards to like, but what we believe as Christians is that Jesus isn't looking for an opportunity to um, dismiss you. Jesus isn't looking for, for a reason to discredit you or cast you aside. Jesus wants to connect with you. He wants to love you. He wants to accept you regardless of who you are, what you've been doing, what you've done. Because the truth is this, that all of us as Christians are going to make really bad choices in our lives as Christians that people would look at and say, that's not something Christian to do or that's sin or, or what have you. And the, the belief is that as we've been traveling through through moral fabric. It's not that we're trying to make our lives tidy so that God would accept us or so we're morally superior, but rather we're trying to connect with Jesus' voice and allow Him to lead us and Him to guide us. And our belief is this, that as we do that, then our lives are transformed into the image of Jesus. And one, one of the thoughts is that, that, that comes up anyways, that like when we're talking about moral fabric like oh we're talking about being morally superior to the world around us or, or we are like suggesting these are the things that you must do so that God can accept you that God can love you and he put the first slide up please will we start having this thought that um this is this is what it is that this is a whole lot of moral fabric is thou shall not do and thou must do as far as taking off the old old testament specifically the king james version of the ten commandments thou shall not do this thou shall not do that you must not as far as it's all about law what you have to do and what you have to, what you can't do, and what you must be doing in order for God to accept you, and and if that's the sense that's come out of it, it's completely been missed. And I'm not suggesting that people have, but the last thing that what we want to do is travel through this series, and then people have this idea that God's just looking for good actions. God's looking for a connection with Him, or or moral fabric is about good actions. Moral fabric isn't just about this. This. If we go to the next slide, thou shall not do and thou, sh- thou must do is less about rules. As far as it's less about what you have to do or what you can't do or what you must do or what you have to have happening in your life. And it's more about discerning what voice it is that you are listening to. And so the, the idea of what we're wanting to bring across um, through the, or what we've been trying to bring across through this series is Jesus' voice. What Jesus is talking, where Jesus is leading, what Jesus is asking, what Jesus is calling us to do, not for him to accept us, but rather so we can follow him for the simple reason. You might be like, why is that? Why is that? Well, the next slide would say this, that the voices that we listen to become the God or the gods that we follow. Like the thing that you constantly listen to will, be, will become the thing that will guide you, will direct you, will lead you, that you will follow it. It'll tell you to go here. It'll tell you to go there. And, and you'll end up following it because it's the voice that you're listening to. And we, we all have voices in our lives that we listen to. But the, the big question that um, we're wanting to, or the, or the big idea that we're wanting to bring across through Moral Fabric is that we're deliberate in listening to Jesus' voice and allowing Him to lead us and allowing Him to guide us rather than everything else around us. So to wrap up, um, moral fabric, I thought best or not, I thought fitting to go back to the origins of humanity, the origins of creation, the origins as best we know it of Jesus, of, of God. And so that looks like going all the way back to the start of the Bible in this book called Genesis. And, and Genesis opens and it starts with God creating something, God creating the world, God creating humanity. And so in Genesis 2 from verse 4, it says this, when, God, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, as far as this is God's creation, you can go back another chapter and there's a, another overview of this as well, but this is the overview sort of thing. No grass or plants were growing anywhere. God had not yet sent any rain and there was no one to work the land, but streams came up from the ground and watered the earth. The Lord God took a handful of soil and he made a man. And he, what, what it doesn't talk about here is when God makes the woman Eve. And so he's talking about God making the man Adam. But at the same time, not necessarily at the same time, but if you were to go back earlier in Genesis 1, like God makes woman Eve as well. So this is God creating humanity. God took a handful of soil and made and made Adam. And then after that, he puts Adam into a deep sleep and he takes a piece of, of Adam and he, and, he, and he makes the woman, he makes Eve. And then he does this, he breathes life into the man and the man started breathing. As far as this is what separates us from animals, this separates us from everything else that God has breathed and God is breathing his life, his spirit, his everything into us. And then the, the Lord made a garden in a place called Eden, which was in the east and he put man there. Continues on, the Lord God placed all kinds of beautiful trees and, and fruit trees in the garden. And then there was two other trees in the middle of the garden. One of the trees gave life and the other gave the power to know the difference between right and wrong. 
Verse 15 goes on. And then the Lord God put the man in the garden of Eden to take care of it and to look after it. So he's put him in there and he says, I've got a role. I've got a job for you. I've got responsibility that I want you to do. And I want you to look after the creation that I've made. I want you to look after where I've placed you. And I'm placing you somewhere in a deliberate spot for a deliberate purpose because I've got something in store for you. And so he places Adam and he places Eve there. He places humanity, Adam and Eve, in this garden to take care of it. But the Lord told him, you may eat fruit from any tree in the garden except the one that has the power to let you know the difference between right and wrong. If you eat fruit, any fruit from that tree, you will die before the day is over. So he places Adam and Eve in the garden. He places them in their existence where he's created them. He's putting them there. He's given them roles. He's given responsibility. And he's given them a choice. And that the choice ultimately looks like what voice is it that you're going to listen to? And he continues on when it gets to chapter 3. It says this, the snake was sneakier. Snakes are sneaky. Have you noticed that they're sneaky? You can never hear them unless they're in the grass. And it's, you can hear the grass moving. But they're sneaky. They're slippery little suckers. The snake was sneakier than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. And then one day it came to the woman and it starts talking. Like, my gosh, there's a talking snake in the Bible. There's talking donkeys in the Bible too. And there's a talking snake at the beginning. It, it's a good story. So one day he came to the woman and asked, did God tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? So the the snake turns up and it starts asking a question like, did God really do this? Is this what happened? Like, what's your thoughts on this, Eve? Like, what's happening? And then then Eve, the woman, she answers. So now she's responding to this voice that starts talking to her. Remember remember the whole, whole idea of the voices that we listen to determine the God that you follow. God said we could, this is what Eve says, God said we could eat fruit from any tree in the garden except the one in the middle. He told us not to eat fruit from that tree or even touch it. She, she inserts that one little bit in it. If we do that, she says, we will die like it's going to be lights out. It's not going to be a good thing for us. And then the, the, the snake, he replies with this, no, you won't. Nothing's going to happen. It's going to be fine. Decay is not going to set in. You're not going to have to go into palliative care. Nothing's going to, it's not going to be a bad thing. You're going to live. It's going to be fine. So he says, no, you won't. The snake replied, God understands what will happen on the day that you eat fruit from that tree. This is what will happen. You will see what you have done and you know the difference between right and wrong, just as God does. I love this, that this snake turns up and it starts talking to, to Eve. It starts giving her ideas. It starts saying, as, uh, asking questions and inserting its thoughts, its ideas, and giving her perhaps something else to follow. And with, with the, the idea behind like this, is always voices speaking to us. You may not be living in the garden and you may not have a talking snake in your life, but there's always voices speaking to you. And, and some of you are like, I've got a snake and it's talking to me and it's not good. It's such and such a person. Some people we equate as snakes. Like we've, we've always got voices um, um, talking to us. And, and it looks like this if we were to use um, Christian language. Everything is preaching. Or everything is communicating. Everything is proclaiming something. Everything is trying to get a point across. That's what happens in, in life. That's what, when you connect with friends and family. They're trying to get their point across. Not necessarily in a bad way to manipulate you or anything, but when you when you ask a question or when you get into a debate or anything, someone's trying to something is trying to get its point across. That's what movies do. There's always there's always voices talking to us, wanting to push its voice across. You may not have a talking snake, but you got something, in it, and it look, looks like this. As far as we've we've all got different um, voices speaking to us, and perhaps for you, it's your own drive for success. If you, specifically, if you're, if you're one of those, like, just wanting to accomplish everything, wanting to take over the world, wanting to see everything happen, wanting all the, like, like different people are different. Some people just don't even care about success. Other people, this is everything that drives them. And so this is the voice that starts talking to you, suggesting to you. And, and it's got all sorts of things, like, it, like the, your own drive for success never tells you when to say no. It always tells you to say yes, 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 yes. How do I know this? Because this is what Robert struggles with. Robert being me in the third person. Like your own voice of success will, will generally be your, your downfall, but it also looks like as far as I really need that job, it's going to be, look really good. It's going to help me advance further forward. So it's going to be okay to put a little white lie on my resume. 
It's, it's going to be okay to do that because it's going to help me advance forward. And that's, that's my voice that's speaking to me. So that's my voice driving to success. That's not my voice. That's the voice of success. I haven't necessarily lied on a resume. So I haven't ever done a resume. Um, the, 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 the voice for success, it does other things. It it's, makes a suggestion. It's okay to belittle that person or pull that person down a little bit to make me look a little bit better. Because if it makes me look a little bit better, then it's going to help advance my career. It's at the detriment of them. But when I get someone, I'm going to bring them up behind me and it's going to be good for everyone. So like the voice of success, it steps in and it starts having input. And it's the voice that someone's listening to and some of us listen to, but then there's, there's other voices. There's Netflix and there's movies which speak to us and they, they give us these ideas on, on how life can be, how life should be. You got like all these different movies, and the one that constantly comes to mind. And some of these things are hilariously funny. I'm gonna admit they're hilariously funny. Like you got movies like The Hangover. And some of you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you are starting to giggle already because you've watched it. There's no judgment on you. I bless you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> they're hilariously funny. But what they start doing is start proclaiming this is a way that it's okay to live, and it, and it says you can do whatever you want, and it's going to be fine. You can do it whenever you want to do it. You can do it with whomever, and there's no problem. There's no issues. It's no problem, and there's zero consequences. That's what we looked at in week one, and it, pre it um, presents this idea that everything is good. And Netflix and Stan and just general TV shows do the same thing with like you got the Bachelorette and you got the Bachelor, and like yeah, that's a great idea of how to date and um, determine relationships and, and and everything. But what these do, they they start speaking. Their voice is speaking to us in the background. They may not be up front necessarily in the in the front of our mind, but they're speaking to us and starting to minister to us and starting to declare something in the background of our mind that we start listening to. But it, it continues on. You got friends. They speak don't they? They've got all sorts of good advice. Has anyone discovered friends have got great advice? Has anyone discovered that friends have just got good advice in their opinion, but not in, like, not in reality? Uh, as, as far as friends have got, so I have, I have received some incredible advice from friends, and then I've heard some incredibly bad advice from some of my friends that I need to run away from. Uh, as far as it's not good, it, it is amazing some of the advice that friends come up with. Like friends have always got the best relationship advice. And you can put, if you know, the next slide is family. Family fit in here. But friends and family can really go together because they've got the best relationship advice at times. But so, sometimes what I, what I find really fascinating with this is that the friends and family, they're not even married per se, and they want to tell you how to work through your marital problems, or they've just gone through divorce after divorce after divorce, and they're wanting to help you with, with your marriage. You're like, I'm not sure if this is the, the voice that I should be listening to, but yet we do. Or they're like, this is how you need to save money or invest money, but yet they're broke, and they're always broke, and they're always having to borrow money from you. And, and some of us, these are the voices that we're listening to. That are, that are leading us, that are, that, are, that, are, that are guiding us. The voices we listen to, they end up becoming the gods that we follow. But it continues on that we've got our own thoughts that speak to us, that minister to us, that have ideas for us. And this is generally the opposite of your own drive for success. It's the negative voices that start speaking to you. For some of you, it looks like this. It's other people's voices on playback in your mind telling you you're no good, that you're, you're worthless, that you're not loved, that, that um, people would be better off if you weren't there, you would be better off without them, that you need to look this way, you need to look that way. As far as your own voices are on repeat, telling you over and over again, these become the gods that we start following. But then there's another one, there's stress, there's fear and anxiety starts speaking to us. And, and these are the gods that we sometimes start to follow. And this is what's happening with, with Eve in the story. The stake turns up and he starts inserting its ideas, his ideas into her and as far as here's something good to follow. And I think one of the things that we miss with it or, 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 or what we generally do as Christians is we, we read the story to where all of this happens in an instant. So as far as Eve's walking along and the idea that we normally have is that she gets to the tree of the knowledge of what's right and wrong and then all of a sudden the snake's there. That's normally, and then this conversation happens in a second. Well, not necessarily a second. It's just one small time, and then then she takes the fruit, then she eats it. But like, if you've ever been like deceived or had your mind changed about something, rarely does it happen in, in an instant. It happens over a process of time. Uh, as as far as generally, when you believe something to be true, and you've always believed something to be true, any other thought is working against that, and it takes time to dislodge that thought. So Eve's idea and Adam's idea is that we can't eat this. 
And that's what we've generally got. We've got ideas that we, we believe that we should found our lives upon, but depending on what voices we listen to over a period of time will determine as to whether we believe that's something good to continue to walk forward into the future. So this is how I, if I was to insert my own opinions into the Genesis story of Adam and Eve, it would look like this. Eve's just doing life, just like you're doing life. You're going to work every other day, every day, except for the weekends perhaps, and, and you're connecting with friends, you're connecting with family, you bring home paychecks, you're trying to pay off a mortgage, you, you, you're renting, you, you, you're doing life, you, you've got hobbies, and you, you're doing what you're called to do at this period of time, what you have to do at this period of time. And something similar to, for, for Eve, she's just, I don't necessarily know what she had to do in the garden, but maybe she was helping the bees pollinate, or she was finding all these fruit and veggies, and like, my goodness, look at all the zucchini, what am I going to do? So she just spends the next couple of weeks making zucchini relish, because there's so much zucchini, and anyone that's had a veggie garden knows those suckers just keep growing. One plant, one plant is enough. Um, and so she's just she's just doing whatever. She's discovering new plants, new animals, and she's, she's doing life in the garden where God created, where God placed her. And then, like, this is how I'd think it. She's in her veggie garden. I'm not sure if there was a, a designated veggie garden section, but let's say there was. There, she was in the veggie garden section. And then, like, because there's lots of long, tall things like tomato bushes, there's, that's where snakes hide. That's where snakes hide, where they can be hidden. And then all of a sudden, she sees a snake. And this snake's like, what's up? And she's like, yeah, it's talking snake. How cool is this? What's up to you? And they start having this dialogue. And I, I think it would, it would it would start with as uh, like just just questions and and answers like any relationship generally starts and then perhaps a couple of days later come back and they they talk again and and, he, and he's like so what do you think about the garden and she's like I think it's great there's just there's one tree it looks really good but I'm not going to touch it and he's like oh why not because God said this oh okay and then maybe a week later they they meet up meet up at the local juice bar or whatever bar it is that they had in the Garden of Eden and and um and then and then the snake's talking to her again now he's got some more questions like what is God really actually say like when he when he put you here what did God really really say and so she shares that he doesn't say much and then the next meeting he starts like inserting more of his opinions did God really say that because I don't think he did I really don't think he did and then I like after all this time all this connection and conversation it starts becoming the voice that she's listening to and then after a period of time she starts agreeing with that voice like yeah that must be right I must have misunderstood misinterpreted I misread. I, I'm not listening to God properly. I'm not understanding it quite right. So I think this voice must be okay to listen to. And so then we get to this point here. If we go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. We've gone past that. Where the woman stares at the fruit. Like Eve looks at the fruit. So she's had all these encounters with the snake. And then like, and I, what I don't necessarily agree with or, or believe that she was standing right by the tree when she immediately had the conversation with the snake. I think what's happened is she's had this conversation. Then one day she's walking and she sees the fruit. She stares at it and she's like, my gosh, that looks good. Because this voice has been speaking to me. This voice has been encouraging me. This voice has been telling me this is something good to base your life around, similar to what your own drive for success does or what your friends and your family do or what movies are doing for some of us who stress and anxiety is trying to tell you to do and so she stares at the fruit and she looks at it and believes and discovers like that is beautiful that's something good and it's tasty I can see that it's tasty and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her and she ate some of the fruit she sees everything and she's like I'm gonna taste that it looks good similar to what the advice of our friends and our family is to us it looks like it's good and because we've heard it for so long it's tasty it's got to be right it's got to be do something for me it feels right so it must be right and then her husband he was there as well and so and that's Adam and so she gave some to him and he ate it too which would generally suggest as as far as her and Adam have had the discussion as well over a period of time that I think this is going to be okay so they eat it and then this is what happens and then right away they saw what they had done and they realized that they were naked so sin enters the world, shame enters the world, destruction enters the world. As far as all of a sudden there's something wrong with me. Notice how there's nothing wrong with creation. They don't see anything wrong with creation. It's just, it's just what's wrong with me. And so they, 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 they feel shame. So they grab some figs and they sew them together to make something so they can cover themselves. And then late in the afternoon, a breeze begins to blow. And the man and the woman hear the Lord, Adam and Eve. They hear God. He's walking through the garden. Now frightened and they hid. And again, you've got something else entering into life. They've chosen, they've chosen to, to follow 
another voice and this other voice has brought in shame. This other voice has, has brought in this feeling of self-inadequacy. This other voice now has brought in terror. This other voice has brought in, I feel scared. They were frightened and they hid. And then the Lord called out to, to Adam, the man, and asked this question. He's like, where are you? And he's like, die, he's God, he knows everything. But he, he, like God's calling out to him. See, he, he's wanting Adam's response. He's wanting Adam to come up, to be clean, to, to talk to him about what's happening. And, and, and the man answered, Adam answers, I was naked as far as I felt shame. I followed another voice and I felt shame. And when I heard you walking through the garden, I was frightened. I followed this other voice and now I've got fear um, leading me and guiding me and ascending me and it's causing me to want to hide. And then so God says to him, how on earth did you know that you were naked? Did you eat from any of the fruit in the tree of the middle of the garden? The stuff that I said, that's not a good idea to eat. Just stay away from that. And Adam says this. I love it. If we go to the next slide, he's like, the woman that you gave me, she made me do it. And since Adam has said that, men have been using that as a reason for, um, since like the beginning of time. Ultimately, so he starts pointing blame. He's like, it was the woman that you put here. It was Eve. She's a bad egg. She gave me some of the fruit and then I, then I ate it. So he's not wanting to take any form of responsibility. He's not wanting to deal with the struggles in his heart, the issues that are in his heart that we talked about in week two. And then the Lord God, he turns to the woman. He says, what have you done? And then she does the same thing. She's like, it was a snake. He tricked me. And so everyone's just pushing blame, pushing blame. No one wants to deal with the, the, the struggles. No one wants to deal with the issues, the, the heart problems that they're carrying. So she says, I ate some of that fruit because I was tricked by the snake. And so then God turns to the snake and he says this, because of what you have done, you will be the only animal to suffer this curse. For as long as you live, you will crawl on your stomach and you'll eat dirt. And this woman... You and this woman will hate each other. Your descendants and hers will always be enemies. One of hers will strike you on the head and you will strike him on the heel, suggesting and highlighting Jesus coming. Then the Lord said to the woman, you will suffer terribly when you give birth, but you will still desire your husband and he will rule over you. And then he gets to the man and he says this, the Lord said to the man, you listened to your wife. Now, what I'm not trying to suggest is it's a bad thing to listen to your wife. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. It's a very good thing. But he, like God says, because you listen to your wife, because you listen to someone else's voice other than mine, because you, you chose to follow something other than what, that I wanted, what I had in store for you and where I was leading you, because you chose to go somewhere else, because you listened to something else, you've arrived here and you ate from that fruit, from that tree, and you've arrived with this problem, with this dilemma and then from from there like i'm not we're not going to read it out but then god offers to adam the same issues that he offers to eve as far as because you've done this this is the consequences for that because you've eaten that fruit because you listened to, to another voice with so the whole idea is this if you go to the next slide sorry will um the, the voices that we listen to the whole idea that this is trying to present to us that the voices that we listen to would become the god or the gods that we follow for some of us, it looks like the God that we're following is our friends. Sometimes they've got great advice. Sometimes they've got bad advice. For, for some of us, it's, it's our own personal drive for something, whether it's, whether it's for success, whether it's for something else. Some of it's our own thoughts that are bouncing through our head. Some of it's, it, it looks like we're trying to please people. For some, some of us, it, it, it looks like the movies. They're, they're the things that are drawing and guiding and directing us. They're the voices that we're listening to. And, and we, we proclaim that we love Jesus. And what I'm not trying to say is that even if you do this, that you don't love Jesus. But what I'm trying to suggest is this, that though we might proclaim that we love Jesus, it would suggest that he's not our Lord but rather another voice is our Lord. And so the whole idea behind moral fabric isn't to determine what you have to do and what you can't do, but rather to challenge you with what voice is it are you listening to and what does Jesus' voice sound like? Um, Jesus has this to say in, in John chapter 10, um, with, with some really interesting background behind it. But he says this, he says, my sheep know my voice. And so if you're a Christian this morning, you're one of Jesus' sheep. If you're not a Christian this morning, God's wanting to bring you into his flock. He's wanting to bring you in to look after you protect you and to lead you and jesus says my sheep and he, he's, he's talking about his people his christians the, as far as my followers they know my voice and and i know them and they follow me and i give them eternal life and we do good things together and all, all the rest but the, the background to, to this is as far as this is jesus talking about sheep herding days which was somewhat different specifically exceedingly different to how we would herd any form of animals today and you can drop that slide will 
But like, so for those of you that haven't worked with animals, the general way, specifically in the West, that we work with animals is that we move from behind them and we herd them forward. We push them forward. We chase them. We're like not necessarily trying to scare them, but we're, we're trying to drive them somewhere to get the where they're going. So we'll, we'll go up and we'll set up all the gates. And then if it's a big area, we'll have someone like go out on the motorbike or horseback or however, and then turn them off and head them off. And that's how we, we, we generally do that. And we do that with sheep and anyone's work with sheep. We're like, oh my gosh. And, um, uh, so, and we, we do that with all sorts of animals. And, but this is really, really different to how they did it. The shepherds would walk in front of the sheep and the sheep would follow them. Like the, the the sheep would just know the shepherd's voice and, and, and follow them, and and some commentators would say like the shepherd would call each sheep by name as to whether they it was exactly that or it was just come on come on come on. All the dairy farmers were like, what's going on? What are we doing? <laughs> and the, and so the, like the Jesus was saying, my sheep know my voice and they they follow me. But the, 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 it gets more interesting again than that because what he's what he's um he's talking about is that all the sheep every night they would go they'd leave the field and they'd come and they'd, they'd go into this yard for the night so that they're protected so that nothing could get them and then someone would guard the gate and in the guarding of the gate so that no sheep escaped and then nothing got in that could hurt the sheep and then the shepherds they'd go and they'd get some sleep they'd get some rest and sometimes they'd take in turns who was who was guarding it but the, the interesting thing was like how we would normally do this is my sheep are in this pen the, um Adam's sheep are here, Karina's sheep are here, here, so forth. As, as far as we'd, we'd pen up all, all our different pens of sheep so there's no confusion, so we easily get them out into the pen at, at the end. But they didn't do it like that. Everything went in the group together. So if there's four pens of sheep, like one shepherd, he had, he had 98 sheep, and the, and the other one he had 230, and like, like, as far as just pick whatever numbers you want. This is a really big pen, huge pen. Sheep doesn't have to be that big, but... Big pen. And all the, all the sheep are in there, and then the shepherds, they, they leave, and all the sheep are in together. And so what they don't do is that it's not like this couple of hours of drafting in the morning to work out what sheep are, what the shepherd would go and stand in front, and he would say, come on, come on, come on. And his sheep would leave the rest of the sheep and walk out of the pen, and he would lead them. And all the others would stay in there until their shepherd turned up. And that, so the sheep would know the sound of the voice that was meant to be leading them. And so then the shepherd would, would take them and he'd walk in front of them and he would, he would lead them to, 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 to pasture where they could, could eat that was acceptable to eat. And then he would take them to water for them to drink and then back to pasture and then back into the enclosure for the night. And then this would constantly repeat over and over again that this was this leading. And this, this whole idea of, of joining the two together as far as what God was wanting to, to insert into Adam and Eve was this, I want you to follow my voice. My voice will lead you to something that's good. My voice will lead you to life. My voice will protect you. My voice is going to comfort you. My voice is going to look after you, but you need to follow me, not the voice of everything else that is speaking to you. And the reality is this, that where we live, there's always something speaking to us, proclaiming something to us, sharing with us, giving us ideas, giving us thoughts and asking us ultimately to follow its leading But what Jesus is wanting to say is I want you to follow my voice not my rules not my regulations not what you have to do in order for me to accept you but I want you to follow my voice and out of that you will be transformed out of that you'll be led to good pasture out of that you'll be led to water some of us end up in in this place where we're like I can't hear God's voice I can't follow his leading I'm I'm struggling I'm, I'm struggling to know which way to turn I'm struggling to know what it looks like. And it, it looks simple, like this. Following Jesus' voice, if we keep moving, we'll, it looks like reading your Bible. You know, I read my Bible, but I get nothing out of it. And plenty of people sit in that place. Like, I read my Bible, but I don't get any, anything out of it. H- how many of you drink water just because you've got a glass of water in front of you? Not because you're dehydrated, not because, you, not because necessarily you're exceedingly parched, but because you know that your body needs it and your body's telling you you need it. Um, what we believe as Christians is the Word of God is the same. It's something that we need, that our spirits need. And sometimes it's got nothing to do with intellectually getting anything out of it, but it's got everything about what our spirits are getting out of it. And so when we constantly make this um, decision, constantly to read the Bible, it starts becoming a voice in our life, as far as God's voice in our life, that it starts leading us and guiding us. And it doesn't have to be chapters and chapters and chapters. It could be a chapter. It could be a handful of verses reading until something jumps out at you and then reflecting on that, like, my gosh, what does, what does that mean? What does that, that look like? There's a, just a deliberate effort to read. And we, it continues on as far as there's a, a whole host of thoughts. There's a small group in church. We call small groups links, if you haven't worked out. 
And, and so the idea is that we connect together. We develop together. We connect together so that we're fellowshipping together, so that there's someone sowing into us, so there's someone that, that we know that there's people deliberately praying over us. And, and the, the big thought here is that generally when we step out of community, isolation starts breeding unbridled revelation where we just start depicting what we want God to be saying, what we want God to be insinuating with that scripture, suggesting out of that scripture. We start depicting what we want out of it. When we, when we step out of community, that's generally what starts happening. And, and a hard fact that we struggle with is, 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 is often when it comes to our faith growing and our faith maturing, it will happen at the consistency that we connect together. These are the ways that we hear Jesus' voice. It's not the only ways that we hear Jesus' voice, but the other ways is, is we volunteer. The best way to hear Jesus' voice is just to volunteer. I'm not saying you volunteer at church. Maybe your neighbor's lawn needs mowing. We're like serving Jesus, following Jesus' leading will always lead you to serving people, to helping people, to connecting people. So if you're not sure what God's voice is saying to you, start serving people, start connecting with people, start looking after people, start helping people. And if that's your job, well, you need to do that outside of that because generally there's a difference. This is how we hear God's voice. But then there's other ways. There's ask questions. You can't listen. You can't hear God unless you ask questions. It's not just ask questions of God. Here lies the benefit of small groups slash links and church. If you're not engaged with that, you can't ask questions and you can't have that sewn into you. You can't ask questions that are, that are out there. And you should be able to ask questions that are really out there that you're not sure about, that perhaps will terrify everyone and think you're falling off the face of the earth. But if those are the things that are, that are bouncing around your head, you need to be able to ask them so that people can help you grow through it or as far as that's a really good thought never thought of that i'm challenged now as far as this is how we hear god's voice and then the other one is allowing godly leaders to challenge us something that we've specifically as as westerners we really pushed away from i don't want to be challenged anymore but someone in, in authority authority hasn't got the the right to challenge me this is how i think and i've got the right to think this way rather than allowing someone that you respect and i'm not just saying just because someone has a title you should allow them necessarily to speak into your life they, they have to have, have earned that opportunity to speak into your life um, likewise with me i'd like to think that i've earned for most of us the opportunity to be able to speak into your life and perhaps challenge you at times when when need be but that, that listening to god's voice looks like allowing people to speak into our lives to challenge us with what we're struggling with what we're thinking what we're going through with how we're living with what what we're doing not because we have to live right in order for god to love us but rather so we can be attuned to jesus voice and his leading and his guiding so we don't end up where Eve is being deceived by another voice. The whole idea behind this is, is the point with the last slide. That the voices that we listen to the voices that we listen to become the God or the gods that we follow. I don't know about you but what, what I want out of life is I want my life to be the best possible life that I can have. I want my, my, I want my kids to grow up living the best possible existence while they're under my care that they can. I want my spouse to flourish as best as she can while we're married together. And I'm not saying while because we're going to divorce or anything, but like one day one of us will die and then we won't be married. And so while we're together, as long as we live, like I, I want her to, to flourish as best as she can. I want the church to flourish as best as, 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 as we can while I'm the leader here. I want my business to grow as best as it can while I'm doing what, what, what I'm doing. And in my mind, the best way that I can do that is that I'm deliberate in following Jesus' leading, in following His instruction, in His calling. And the whole idea behind moral fabric is this, not this is what you must do, this is what you have to do, this is what you can't do, but it's rather this is what Jesus is talking to you about. And so the reason that we've talked about this and shared this is if this is something that was dear to Jesus' heart, when he walked on this earth and he preached about and he talked about, we see it fitting that we share about the same thing now. And so what I want to do, I don't know about you, but I want to be a person that is deliberate in discerning what voices it is that are speaking to me, what voices it is that are, that are making suggestions, that are having input in my life. And I want to be sure that the predominant voice that is speaking into my life that I'm listening to, that I'm allowing to lead me is Jesus' voice and is Jesus leading and is Jesus guiding. And I think if, if, we, if we are deliberate, in stepping into that and allowing Jesus to be the predominant leader in our life, we won't wind up in this position where we're like what we looked at in week two with the, with the foolish builder where everything comes crumbling down on them. 
I think we'll we'll end we'll end up in in this in this life where we keep going from strength to strength. Not to say we're not going to have heartache and hardship or anything like that, but we'll be able to sail through that, knowing that we've got a comforter, knowing that we've got a light, knowing we've got someone guiding us, leading us to calmer weather. And that's Jesus, and that's His voice, and that's His leading. So how about you stand? I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you that you're not you're not looking to to see what's wrong or, or right with us, Father, but rather you, you're you're looking to see Jesus in us, Father. And I pray that we're doing the same thing too, and I pray that we're looking for your your leading and your guiding. I pray that we're looking for your voice. We're, we're looking for you to speak to us, to minister to us, to to, to guide us, to call us, Father. I pray that we can, um, all of us are, are deliberate with discerning what voice it is that is calling to us, Jesus, and with the understanding or with the picture that, that we're, we are the sheep sitting in the pen. And there's always voices calling. And some of those voices are calling to other sheep, Father. And, and I pray that we can be um, individuals, that we can be people that are discerning what voices it is that are calling to us, Jesus, and that we can know when it is your voice that is calling, that we can follow it, that we can be led by you, God. And I thank you that as we do that, you lead us to good pasture. You lead us to something good. You lead us to, 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 to water, to, to rehydrate us. You lead us to life, Father. So I pray that as we run through this series, Jesus, moral fabric father that it's not about what we have to do in order to be accepted to be loved by you it's not about being morally superior father but it's rather knowing what your voice is saying to us what your voice is calling us to do what your voice is calling us to step into and we're deliberate with being able to follow suit with that voice father so i pray for everyone here for, for those of us that struggle with that that, that that struggle with being able to discern what voice it is that's talking to us i, I pray god that your voice becomes loud that your voice becomes real real, that your voice becomes a predominant voice in, in their lives. Jesus, I pray that as we engage with reading our Bibles, Father, as we engage with community, Jesus, that your voice starts leaping out at us and, and leading us and guiding us, Father. I pray that your voice challenges us. And ultimately, I pray it's your voice that is transforming us into the image of your Son, Jesus, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hey, so we've got... Um, well, that's the end of, end of that series. But next week, we've got something really, really exciting. We've got um, Ryan Grace coming and sharing with us tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Don't turn up. Um, we, we've got Ryan coming and he's sharing with us um, next Sunday. Um, his story, his journey, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And then after that, is that you or is that Chris? There's someone after that. Um, otherwise, there is coffee out there and I am sure of that. So feel free to head out and grab a tier of coffee. Hang around, connect with someone catch up with someone and we'll see you back next week.